Hello and welcome to another cup of coffee with me, Sangi. Life is strange because you can know people for many years, know about them, but don't know about their background. And my guest today uh, is a friend. Uh, I've known him for many years. His name is Ian Giles. And I know him as the classic car club in Spain. But there is so much more to Ian that I didn't know about. So I've invited him to come and join me for a cup of coffee. And I'm just about to uh, accept him. Uh, Ian, are you there? I'm admitting you now into my little office. I just saw a picture of you with, with uh, a, a school cap on. Hello, Ian Giles, how are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm not quite sure where you spotted that one, but... Uh, well, it came up and it was it was rather sweet. I'd rather have seen it for more. Where's the cap? You got it in your hand? I think that was a long time ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> think, it looks... I think it looks that like was a taken from, from a menu from my 65th birthday party. Oh, well, we won't go into numbers, but <laughs> I'm sure that was last week. It was anyway. a long time ago. Welcome to a cup of coffee with me. We've known each other for a very long time. We and certainly fact, have. I think it must be nearly 30 years. And I've only known you um, about the um, Classic Car Club. But then when I've gone into a little bit of your background, I have found out so much more about you which I want you to share with me and my, my audience today. Goodness, I dread to think what you found. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shall only um, give out what I feel will be acceptable. But only the stuff that's not classified. That's exactly, that's right. <laughs> so let's start at the beginning. Um, you are very well known uh, in the motor industry, motor rally, motor cars, anything to do with motoring and rally. Yeah. How did that yeah. start? Um, well, it basically got off the ground when I was in my uh, very early teens. My father was competing in local rallying and I got the bug from there and I was allowed to go out on two events, sat in the back of the car which at that age was the most spectacular experience of my life. And um, from then on, all I ever wanted to do was, was get behind the wheel and drive rally cars or racing cars. Um, so it, the bug set in there. Did you have to have a, a certain age for a license for a rally car? Well, yes and no. You, you could start rallying as a co-driver at any age. And I started when I was 15. But to be a driver, um, you had to have, you know, your normal road traffic acts license, which you couldn't get until you were 17. Yeah. So as soon as I was 17, I passed my test in the first week. And then I just bought the cheapest car I could afford because I was a student. But I still went off doing the sort of disciplines that motorsport allowed you to do then, which was all at club level uh, and was all fun. But the car I had then was already long obsolete uh, but it was a good good thing to learn with so I progressed slowly from there. What was your first car? What was, it was that car? Austin, it was an Austin A35 My and word. I had it in 1969 uh, when I was 17 and it was a 1958 vintage so it was 11 years old then which in today's cars wouldn't be that old but then that was really old because everyone was rallying minis, Ford Escorts, Porsches. So my little Austin A35 was, was very out of place. Okay, so you had the bug and you started uh, rallying. And what was your first rally? Where was it? What uh, well, that was a fun, the fun thing that is that my very first rally was when I was 17 as a driver, this is. Uh -huh. in 1959 my co-driver was my best friend who was two years older than me but he'd had a big accident when we were racing push bikes and broken his neck 
and was confined to a wheelchair. So what we did, we strapped the wheelchair into the boot of the car, uh, locked him into the passenger seat of the car, and he had one uh, little map light that was dangling from the roof because we put it in so badly, uh, and we set off to go rallying. Well, it, in those days, road rallying was done at night, so you started very late at night and stayed rallying until perhaps eight o'clock the following morning on a Sunday. Well, unfortunately, through the entire rally, we only saw one time control on the entire event out of about 40. And um, we only saw, saw one other rally car, which was going the wrong way down a very difficult time section. And I bounced off the back of it and my attempts to go down the hill too fast, even though I was going the wrong way. So oh, that, that was not, not an auspicious start to my rallying career. No, no, but you improved. Oh, yeah, 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 I did a bit. Immensely, because you went on to win many, many rallies. Give me an idea of what you've won. Let's um, grab a little bit. Come on. Well, the, no, the, the, well, the, I've won some championships. I won a lot of club events. I won some national events. Uh, I finished in the top three of big events like the Rothmans National. Uh, I've been in the team that won on the Welsh Rally. Um, so I've done quite a lot of things but I've also done a bit of racing and I've I'm pleased to say I've attempted every discipline that there is in motorsport from auto tests to auto crosses to hill climbs sprints circuit races rallies I've been done some teaching so I've done most everything um, one of the nicest events I've won was an event that was local to me which was called the wildlife wildlife stages rally which I won three years running, and that was quite a quite a pleasure to uh, to achieve that. That was a lot of fun. Why was it called the Wildlife? It was run through a wildlife park, oh. um, the fam famous Crickets and Thomas Wildlife Park, where the TV series To the Manor Born was filmed. Um, and they could it, it was big enough that they could close it to. Uh, the public, obviously, and they could put in about a dozen special stages within, all within the park. So they had to close off all the wildlife, literally, and hence it was called the Wildlife Stages Rally. But my, to, 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 jump, to jump a decade or two, yeah. uh, my last event was there as well. Uh, I'd won it three years running and I was doing it as a sort of guest uh, appearance, but I was sponsoring a lot of cars. I had a team of minis that were competing and my pal that I told you about, Nick, yeah. was um, navigating for his brother in one of our cars and they were very, very quick. And they seed these rallies from one to, say, 130, whatever it is. And I was seeded at number one and they were seeded at number two. So you can imagine that their big thing was to beat me. The rivalry and was it, tremendous. Yeah, it was. Unfortunately, there was an enormous accident and my pal was killed. Okay. So I, um, um, I didn't do a great deal. Well, I did go back to rallying a bit later, but the kind of serious stuff, I stopped then. And that was 1980. I did continue rallying till about 1985, 86. Nice. But the serious stuff stopped then. That must have affected you quite uh, enormously. It did, more than I realised at the yeah. time. I thought at the time I could just waltz through it and that I would be okay. Um, I even had to come home and my business ran from his parents' home. And I even had to come home and explain to his mother what had happened. Oh. And one thing that I learned, though, from her, which I've never forgotten, she, I said to her, um, because her kitchen was our office, um, it was the business that paid for the rallying and it was the rallying that helped build the business. So we had a whole team of cars and I ran everything from her kitchen and on the Sunday night, when I got home to tell her what had happened, I said to her, well, obviously we'll close you know, tomorrow for the week. And she said, oh, no, dear. She said, you, you, you open as normal. She said, uh, life and business must go on. Um, she said, so you be in as normal and, and open. And we did, um, which is, I suppose, where I get my kind of work ethic from and discipline from. Yeah. Um, that I don't believe you stop working unless you're, um, dragged off in a box somewhere, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, an, an amazing lady to have that kind of feeling inside uh, because obviously 
uh, she was strong, but she, as you said, yeah. her ethics were incredible and they uh, rubbed off on you. But you were also, yeah. uh, over your years of uh, in the motor rallying and you were sponsored by very big companies. Yes, that's right. I was contracted to British Leyland, as it was then, yes. who manufactured the cars that I was that I was competing in, um, and contracted to people like Dunlop, Esso. Um, I mean, it was a it was a incredibly expensive business to be in, uh, and those sort of sponsorships, whilst they helped, they they didn't pay for anything like the total cost of things. So I would have to fund that myself, uh, and that was quite hard, really. Um, so my business has almost existed to keep the rallying going, whereas the rallying built the um, built helped build the businesses by giving us the exposure and the publicity that we needed. Yeah, it was, so it, it was an exciting time. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever meet my uh, very close friend uh, Sterling Moss? Yes, I did. Actually, there's an amusing story about that because Sterling Moss, although he did a great deal of rallying in his younger days, yes. was really was a circuit man, and sure. probably, the, probably the best and most famous driver we've ever produced. But I was at Goodwood Festival of Speed for the year of his 80th birthday. And I was lucky enough to be invited in a hospitality suite by the Levant Chicane with a load of banking people. And I was sat chatting with them and they realized I was the only one there that was a you know, proper motorsport person. And one of them asked me that question, said, um, do you know Sterling Moss? And I said, no, I don't. I said, I'd very much like to, but no, I don't know him. I've never met him. And with that, a guy called Barry Williams came walking by. Yeah. Barry Williams is yeah. one of the top racing drivers of his day. He yeah. was a close friend of Sterling Moss. Yeah. And he saw me, spotted me sat in, the, in this uh, hospitality suite and shouted at me to come out and say hello. So I said, excuse me, to all these banking chaps and walked outside. And Barry was there, but Sterling Moss was with him. Well, Moss, being a polite old gentleman, obviously assumed that if I was a friend of Barry's, I must know him as well. And he proffered his hand to me and he said, how are you, boy? Uh, which was a normal <laughs> greeting. Yeah. And I said, well, very well, Mr. Moss. Thank you very much. And, and that was about it. And I exchanged my pleasantries with Barry and went back inside and they were all sat there in a circle looking aghast at me or with mouths open and said, I thought you said you didn't know Sterling Moss. <laughs> well, you know, you don't like to brag, do you? So that was my kind of Moss story. So now I never really met him properly and didn't know him, but I would love to have. Well, uh, if I can tell you my little story about Sterling Moss, whom I knew extremely well because he was I'd part of the him. variety club uh, which I was part of. Oh, I understand, yes. And uh, we were at various functions together. And my number five uh, spine surgery in London uh, was at the Wellington Hospital. And many a time, Sterling Moss came to visit me on his motorbike. And the uh, nurses and, and matron used to say, oh, your friend is here, the little one that's got the helmet and the motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, you mean my friend Sterling Moss? And they said, yes. And he was just such a delight. What a wonderful, wonderful man. But then he had this awful accident in his own home. In he the did, elevator he, that broke He down. survived a, a, a massive accident in 1962 at Goodwood, yeah. which people didn't think he would survive. And then he, of course, he had the horrific accident you're talking about in falling down the lift shaft, I think, wasn't it? Uh, well, the, the actual lift just seemed to have dropped and he was oh. injured. And, uh, but he was like a cat with nine lives, an amazing man with lots of stories and tremendous amount of humour and very naughty, very naughty oh, eyes. So I gather, so yes. I gather. And, and just, a, quite, just a fun quite a character. Guy. Yeah, a, yeah, a fun guy. Um, I, I only ever hear good stories about him. Yes, yes. Uh, and, yeah, a man that is written in the books. Oh, very much so. Very yeah. much so, yeah. Very much. Uh, and then you decided it was time to give up being in England. And mm. why did you come to Spain? I couldn't stand the cold. Uh, <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> now, I think, I think like many people... 
I wanted a change of scene. I got divorced. Um, I'd had enough of business. Um, I was stopping rallying. Um, I came out to Spain, um, met a lady who, was, who I was later to marry. Um, so I, I formed an attachment here straight away. But I can tell you one of the reasons that I moved out here was I came out on my very first trip in January 1986 with a pal of mine who was moving out here. And I came just for a week to kind of hold his hand and look around. And we were picked up by, from the airport by uh, this gentleman, taken to his house. And um, he said to me, um, hey, what would you like to drink? And I said, uh, oh, I'd have a gin and tonic if I may, please. And he brought this enormous gin and tonic out for me. And I said to him, my goodness, I said, you pour a mean gin and tonic. And he said, my boy, if you knew how much we had to pay for tonic, you'd know why there's so much gin in it. <laughs> and that's when I thought, I think I'm going to get to like it here. <laughs> so I ended up buying the house next door to him and I'm still there now. Oh, my goodness me. Um, so when you came here, you thought, what can you do? Is that... Yes. In fact, I, there was a hiccup with that. Um, I stayed for a couple of years, but I couldn't really settle. And I think I like a lot of people that come out here, especially as a single person on my own with no job to do, no work, but some money in my pocket. Um, I spent most of my days taking lunch. Um, mm -hmm. And after a couple of years, I realized that this couldn't go on forever. And I went back to the UK for a couple of years. I'd by now met my now wife and... Um, Lovely Carol. Yes. And then we, we came back to Spain for a couple of years. By now we had a property here. Uh, but then we decided that I needed to get back to business and make some money again. So we went back to England for eight years, oh. uh, where, I, where I, although I was out of serious motorsport, um, I helped a little bit arranging classic car rallies that came out to Europe. Um, so we had eight years in, in England until 1990, sorry, from 1993, I think it was, or four, to 2001. And um, in that time, I was helping arrange these classic car rallies. And then we decided to come out here permanently, which is now, as we speak, 20 years ago. That's amazing. So I met you before uh, you were going backwards and forwards to... That's right. Uh, I remember it well. I remember it very well, yes. I uh, remember <laughs> it well. The sunset was a wonderful bottle. I remember what a gorgeous lady you were and still uh, are, of course. Oh, you were too um, kind. You were too uh, kind. That Let's get on life. to... You are now the chairman, president of the most prestigious classic car club uh, in Spain. And um, tell me more about it. What, why did you start it here in Spain? Well, when, I, when we decided to come back here, it was uh, going to be about retirement and maybe just dabble with, with a few odd things like maybe some sports cars or the odd classic cars, partly for fun, partly to, to, to help you know, uh, um, assist our income. Um, but that was not to, to be too successful. Uh, but because I had some cars down here, I started to think that why not form a, a club where we could use the experience that I've gained rallying and the organisational skills that I had and, and take people out, get them to use their classic cars uh, but get them to enjoy the countryside, the scenery, eat good food, drink good wine, because those are passions of mine. I suppose alongside motorsport, it's food and wine are my great passions. So I thought there must be a way to put all that lot together. Uh, to this club of Andalusia, and that was... In fact, I did run another club for two years before that by, um, by invitation. Um, but I decided that the best way to do it was to have something from scratch that was my own. Uh, and that's what gave me the, if you like, inspiration or maybe impetus to, to get this thing going. 
So my idea was that everybody who wanted to join had to have a classic car or right. something that I considered qualified as a classic. What, class what then, qualifies as a classic car? Because I don't know. Well, that's a very interesting question. There's no fixed definition of what, what make us a classic car. And they, they do say age alone doth not a classic make. Uh, now, the reason I say that is that if you take some of our prestige manufacturers like Bentley, Rolls-Royce, Aston Martin, Jaguar, mm -hmm. anything they produce, if one's got a checkbook big enough to go and buy one and drive it out, that to me is automatically a classic. Now, there are, there are a lot who will disagree with me, uh, uh, but generally it's accepted that if a car is 25 years old, as an interesting lineage or, or a, a prestige or interesting history, then 25 years old or more qualifies it automatically as a classic. Well, I didn't want us to take ourselves that seriously. So what I've said is that, well, I will decide whether a car is eligible or not for the club. Um, we'll work on that as a principle, but we'll also incorporate this business of if a car is of an outstanding interest, or, or outstanding prestige, then I'll decide if, it, if it's acceptable or not. Um, and that way, we don't take ourselves too seriously, but we have cars that allow us to, as we would say, do the miles. Uh, and we do do the miles. I, so I, people get out and see the countryside. Yeah, I know that you really do see the countryside and find wonderful restaurants, places to stay. And that leads me into um, what is, besides the eating, drinking, and seeing, and also being a wonderful club, what else is the objective of the Classic Car Club? It's making you exercise your Classic Car. Ah. So it's making you... I, I, I've never been one for static displays. Right. They have their place. Yeah. But it's not for me. Um, we do very occasionally put on a concourse d'elegance, but it doesn't interest me. To me, these cars are meant to be taken out and driven. Um, I'm not one of these people who says oh, it's raining, I shouldn't take the car out of the garage. You know, to me, they, they come out of the garage, whatever the weather, because you should enjoy everything and go out and drive them. So what I wanted to do was get people to, to be led, if you like, by the nose to see Andalusia initially, to drive their cars and enjoy them. I put on a very gentle navigational challenge for them to help them get around the route so they all go the same way. And that way they can all drive entirely at their own pace. Oh. And, and that way then they're seeing the country, they're enjoying their cars, but they're they're having to do the miles yeah. and then they're mixing with like-minded people and finishing up with a decent lunch or dinner and some decent wine um, in interesting places in Andalusia or as we also do in all of the rest of Spain. So mm -hmm. we, ha so it really, that, that is the objective, getting people together to have fun, yeah. and enjoy driving their cars. Yeah, it, that, that's magic. Do you and Carol go and do a recce before you, do one of your trips? Yeah, we do. Um, and uh, to give you an idea, we put on we put on one one day event every month without fail. Right. Uh, yeah, and that means then, but that has to be prepared properly. It's got to be recceed. It's got to be measured. A, the route has got to be drawn. We use a system that's called a tulip roadbook for navigation. It's incredibly accurate, incredibly simple to use. But because of that, it's a lot of work to put it together. Yeah. Now that was, it's called that because it was developed by the organizers of the Tulip Rally in Holland in the 1950s. It's a navigation system that does without language. So it's all, all by um, uh, signs and diagrams, but it's all measured very accurately. So we, we do that. So that means a, a trip out to recce it, uh, often a trip out to plot it, and a trip to check it before doing the actual event. That's, it means, that's a lot of work involved, huh? 
a huge I, amount. I it did, also means I didn't realise uh, that. Oh yeah, and that's for everyone. It also means then meetings with hotels, restaurants, sure. coffee shops. Yeah. Uh, we usually have a carver stop on the way around. And I the thing is, so. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but the club is now so successful that our problem is that we have too many people quite often. Well, I was and, going to um, ask you, is there a yeah. restriction of membership? Not, not yet. Um, it's not unusual for us to take 100 people out on one of these runs and finding venues that can cope with those numbers and then give us a good lunch uh, is very difficult. So you need to start a venue where they have coffee, bacon sandwiches, whatever. Uh, then you need a, a finished venue, which has got to accommodate all of them and their cars. And that's a lot of cars, as you can imagine. So that's got to be put together. And then on top of that, we do at least four long distance tours every year, which are anything from four to seven days. And each one of those is about two months work to do uh, and probably three months continual work. Uh, sorry, three weeks continual work because a week out to check it all, a week to put it together, um, a week to wreck it. Uh, and then a week to actually go out on the event with everyone. So it's, it's, um, it is a massive amount of work, uh, but we do it because we love it. It's yeah, because such it's fun. fun. Absolutely yeah. fun. Um, yeah, and that gets you to see Spain. What, uh, are, are there specific cars that are allowed? Are there cars that you refuse? Um, Have thought, you refused cars? Yeah, not really, only modern ones. Okay. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people hear all about the club and the events and, you know, they, they might have an interest in old cars even, but they want to come along and have fun, but bring their mod what I call the modern silver box, you know, the Range Rover or the, the Kia family hack, and I don't want those on the events. I push the envelope too far as it is, really, um, by accepting lots of cars that are not pure classics, but at least they might be interesting, but we won't take what I call for, uh, silver boxes. Okay. So yeah, we do refuse those. And that, that gets a bit embarrassing sometimes. People think, well, you know, it's a club I can pay to join it. You know, I pay my subscription, why can't I join in? Yeah. And I have to say that I'm really sorry, but we don't want these cars on our events and we won't take them. I'm going to ask you the picture that you've got behind you. Tell me about that car. That, now it's an interesting car. It's a Triumph TR8. Oh, yeah. uh, it's one of only 19 that were built in right-hand drive form. Um, and it's a car that I, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but I still, and have done for the last 20 years, compete in Spanish championship events. And I use that car. So you can see the numbers on the doors, all yeah. the lamps on the front of it. Yeah. Um, that's in the early hours somewhere up in the mountains near Hayen. Um, and again, they seed, they seed these rallies like you would a tennis match. So you can see the numbers on the doors means we're, uh, we're, we're reasonably good at it. I'm going to go back a little bit because you've done a lot of the same things that I've done. You've done a lot of television. You've done um, filming as well. Uh, precision mm. driving for film, yeah. uh, for commercials? Yeah. Commercials, yeah. Yeah, and you've also done reporting or... Yes. Tell me a little bit about that because that's in my world. Yeah, well, I, I can't lay any claims to, 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 to wild success with that, but in the mid-1980s, I think it was, I was approached by BBC Radio Bristol and asked would I do a 10 minute slot on what was going on in the motoring world. And so, yeah, I was very happy to do it. So I did that and they said, well, well, this was very good. Is there anything else that it would interest you that you could offer to do? So I said, well, yeah, well, what about if I got a hold of the current modern supercars or you know the fast cars of the day and road test them oh. and road test them, but do it this is the early 80s, don't forget, but do it live in the car. 
So they thought that was a great idea. So I started by having a sound man come with us where, where we could get him in the back and recording my thoughts and information about the cars as a live road test. And there are not many people had done that, I think then. So that then stretched to them giving me a half an hour to do what I wanted basically on things motoring, um, which I did for quite a time uh, and then got to the stage where I was moving out here. So that, that came to an end then, but I, I really enjoyed doing that. Yeah, that, that again was fun. By the sounds of your life, everything that you have done has really had fun involved. Things that oh, you, you were passionate about and that you love. Uh, if you have to look back on your life, uh, you, you don't have regrets. No, 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 no. You no, made I, the uh, most of it. No, I've enjoyed all of it and uh, I would do it all again. I think, you know, like a lot of people, if I had my time over, there's a lot I would have learned. Um, and I wouldn't have given up the rallying when I actually did. I was, when I gave up, I was just on the verge of that sort of transition to proper paid drives. Um, and I stopped just at the wrong moment and I should have kept going. That was the wrong thing to do. But, you know, we all learn from our mistakes. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't get the chance to do these things again. No. So whilst I don't regret anything, there are things like that I would, uh, I would do slightly differently, I suppose. Uh, if you look to the future, what are you planning to do once we are able to move around? Where is the next wonderful trip? Eat, drink and make merry. <laughs> um, but, uh, but do it. Never um, include me. That upsets me tremendously. <laughs> we, we will try to. Um, we, uh, what I'm doing, I'm holding back from planning anything at the moment. We, we've done very, very well. Without breaking any rules, we managed to put on 10, um, one, 10 or 11 one-day events last year and one five-day event. Uh, in fact, our last five-day event was in March last year. And we, we finished our event on the Friday night that we went into lockdown on the Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and since then, we've managed to put an event on, on all bar one of the months, I think. And we put an event on in January. Uh, we weren't able to do this month, February. So depending on the, on, you know, on the rules and the restrictions that we may hear about later today, um, I would hope by March we might be able to put something on at least a one day event. Right. And then when things really lift, then we'll put on probably a five, six day event. Uh, I've no idea where we'll go, but a lot of us, I do an event that takes us into Portugal. Um, oh. with a stop on the Algarve for a couple of days. So I think I might try and resurrect that. Um, but at the moment, just, Portugal is very, very closed. But Portugal's bad at the moment. So yeah, so I mean, it may well not be possible. And we won't, we won't do anything until we are wholly... Uh, and legally allowed to do so sure. because the one thing I do not want to do is tarnish this club's reputation by doing something that's totally irresponsible sure. we, we kind of push the envelope a bit with what we've done um, but the last event we ran in January we had four to a table we stuck to uh, social distancing we didn't even have a driver's briefing before the event which I normally do I did all that by sheets of paper dished out before the start, um, no coffee stop, no carver stop, um, and a lunch um, meeting where all the rules were observed. So we've, we've tried to keep to keep this proper, you know, we don't want to try and be clever and, and, and circum, circumvent the, the rules. The age group of the people around about, is it a mixed age group? I have to say that the that the average age is, is higher than you might expect. And the reason for that is that, especially down in this part of Spain, in the south of Spain, um, we have people from every nationality participate in our events, uh -huh. but they're all, nearly all people that have retired, yes. obviously some sooner and later than others, mm -hmm. but they're nearly all people who have retired and, and have probably bought cars that they wanted in their youth 
that couldn't afford and now they can yeah. and they look for something to do with them so the average age is higher than you would expect um i mean i'm 67 68. oh you're still a youngster <laughs> Well, I'm a, I am a relative youngster in the car club, so. but everybody that comes out, they're, they're certainly, they're young of heart and spirit, yeah. if not of body. Yeah. yeah. So they're a great crowd. If there are people that want to make contact with you and find yes. out more about the Classic Car Club, how do yeah. they do that? Uh, the, the two ways, really, the first one is to just send me an email. And the email address is quite simple. It's info at cccandalusia.com. Yeah. So info at ccc, as in Classic Car Club, cccandalusia.com. And the Andalusia is with a C and or, not with an S. Uh, that, oh yes, well spotted, with a C, not an S, yeah. Okay. Or they can come through the club's website, right. which is all the W's, cccandalusia.com. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I know that one time you had um, a column in uh, an English newspaper on the coast and oh, yes. uh, it was life in the fast lane and I'm going to say oh. quite honestly uh, your life has been in the fast lane so Ian Jar, this has really been nearly like a, this is your life and I just want to say thank you for taking the time to share your your life in rallying your life in motorsports, your classic car club, and all that you've shared with us today. And to my viewers, if by any chance you saw a notice across the screen that said um, the connection was not good, and a couple of times uh, Ian did freeze, I don't know if it was his side or mine, but we carried on. There's no editing ever because this is such a relaxed program. And Ian, just thank you. And to my viewers, I say, if you enjoyed this as much as I did, you've got the website, you know how to find out more about the Classic Car Club, also more about Ian Giles. And just, Ian, take care. God bless. And uh, to my viewers, I will see you again soon. Uh, Sandy, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much for considering me for your program. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm flattered. I, I think that not having you would have been a sin. So ah. <laughs> take care and just remember, I am around to go on one of the jollies. Don't forget. I'm, I'm going to write that in my diary now, Sandy, and you will be invited as soon as we get going again. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody, and take care and thank you for watching. Bye-bye.